order. Well, room for an adoption of the agenda. Uh, so moved with the addition of discussion items. Okay. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Got a second by Mr. Mitchell. All those in favor? Okay, um, the purpose of this meeting, the primary purpose of this meeting is to discuss uh, not a change in the calendar, but a slight alteration. Dr. Williams, would you like to uh, begin? Yeah, first of all, uh, our team, of course, since March has been monitoring a lot of the activity related to COVID, not just uh, nationally in the state, but especially here in our community. We were able to deliver meals uh, to our community and just see how it was impacting some of our families firsthand uh, March through June. Uh, but we, in the last week and a half, you know, we, we released plans two weeks ago. Last week, uh, we released some remote guidance. Uh, this week, I believe, we're releasing the health guidance. Next week, we'll be releasing student and staff guidance. So all of that combined, we're just kind of chunking it to where one week at a time, we're not inundating everybody. But we, we had a successful week last week. New teacher orientation started, and all of our employees, instead of coming together in one location, Ms. Collins and her team decided to do it at the school levels, and that worked out really well. I got to go and visit those new employees of ours and welcome them to our family, but it was also a different time because you can't see the faces. You know, you can't see them smiling. You can't see the excitement. You can't see the things you would normally see uh, during new teacher orientation, but it, it went very well those three days. And then Friday, uh, board members, thank you all for joining us as well. The graduation for the class of 2020 uh, looked uh, different than it has in the past. Uh, although we had about 460 or so graduates, almost 400 walked the stage. Starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, we finished with the fireworks around 9.30 that night. We had a few hour break, somewhere between 2 to 5. But it was a, just a great, a great day, and it's good to see that as our people, not just employees, but our students and families, as we start to interact with them in a, in a larger gathering, uh, just seeing some of the uh, protocols we put into place, people are following, people are getting used to some of the new behaviors. And that's the one thing that we're going to continue to push is as we start to welcome everyone back to school, we really want people more than anything to understand that this is not school like we've ever had before. We do have to be very uh, optimistic while at the same time being very realistic about our our structure uh, as a school system. So with that said, I, I want to go ahead and just tell everybody that when we started this conversation, our goal from the beginning has been to start face-to-face. -face. Uh, but we've also realized that in the last couple of weeks, some of the data that we're seeing uh, locally uh, is not really looking as positive as we had hoped. Uh, we also uh, have noticed that some of our uh, partnerships, you know, that they're concerned as well with the local data, uh, and we'd like to see it decrease a little bit. So I want to share with you, and I'm going to try and share this screen uh, with everyone that's joining us as well. And on the screen, uh, Ms. Hobson, are you able to see the screen? We're good. So on, on the screen is, is our website. All of our information continues to be posted uh, at the return of the red elephants and all of the information that we provide, uh, including what we discussed tonight, will be located here. I'm gonna bore you with the video with me, but uh, if you wanna be bored, feel free to go ahead and watch it. Uh, but the information that we have is going to be updated there. But what I wanted to share with you was some of the data that we're seeing, uh, not just across the state, but locally. All of you are familiar with the Department of Public Health website, and we know that there's discussion always about the data, what it represents, and all of that. But really, it's one of the best pieces of information that we have available to us as far as making decisions. You see there just the total number of cases, and you would imagine that with any county that's a large or a populated county, you're going to have a high number. So in Hall County, where we're located, uh, we are looking at just over 5,000 cases now total uh, since, since all of this started. When you look at the cases per 100,000, it's a different uh, heat map or a different color range. And you can see that we're the only one in our area. Uh, Whitfield County in the Northwest is a little bit darker. They just recently surpassed us. But when you look at Hall County as a whole, we're looking at 2,400 cases per 100,000. Uh, cases in the last two weeks, we'll look at that in a moment as well. So one of the things that when you look at the data, you realize, you know, if this has been going on since March and we knew that we had a, a, a peak or a spike er, in early, uh, earlier in the, the series of all this, really in April. Uh, but what we want to do is see 
as the state progresses, how are we progressing? So in the last two weeks, this is a new feature that they added, I believe just today, because I don't remember seeing it this morning. In the last two weeks, you can see the scheme uh, where still between Hall County and our neighbors, uh, we are higher than all of them. We are averaging right now about 500 cases uh, every two weeks per 100,000 people. That is significantly up from where it was this time about a month and a half ago. We were in the 175 or so per uh, 100,000. I've been 300 something per 100,000. So we're really we're really looking at the data, really digging in. And so as we look at this information, we also are looking at the trends across time. You see Georgia, and we've seen this in the news as well about the trends in Georgia and how we do have a spike in Georgia, especially recently. You can kind of see uh, later in the last few days or a week or so kind of leveling off at a high rate. But you also have the ability within this chart to select individual counties. And so in Hall County, you remember we were a hot spot back in April. Uh, but what's concerning to us is that this period we've had here in the last couple of weeks surpasses where we were back in April and early, early May. We have that state level data. We have it locally uh, there as well. You can see an average of about 80 cases per day is what we're seeing over that period of time. We also rely heavily on our healthcare professionals at, at NGHS and the guidance that they provide, but also some of the data that they're showing us uh, within their system. And so here's an example of the percentage of cases that are positive. You can see going all the way back to early April, there was a, a peak about mid-April in that 24 to 28 range. What that's saying is 24 to 28 percent of the tests that they're that they are giving are coming back as positive. You can see a nice uh, decrease right there in May all the way through June, but then you start to see that uptick later on here in the last uh, few weeks. And so we're back to this range of 24 to 28% where we were back in April as well. Not only that, as we look at just the numbers, we see that across the, the entire NGHS facilities, they're serving 173, which is the highest number they've served at any point uh, since we started tracking this information. Specifically in Gainesville, we've hovered close to 100 now for the last few days. Uh, and then when you look at the last piece of information on their website, and all of this information is public, both the Department of Public Health and, and the NGHS data, you really start to see this teal and blue color here where it's increased uh, really more than double since what we saw in late May and through June. And what our hope is is that as we pull all of this together, I mentioned before, our goal is to go face to face. But we feel like at this point, right now, at this time, to go face-to-face -face would kind of be a disservice, not only to our health community, but putting our employees and families in a position to where, if it's already at a, a level where we've peaked before, can we comfortably come back? What I want to see are these kind of numbers that we saw here in May and June. So we're not talking about a number that we can't reach. We obviously reached that number before. It's just going to take a more concerted effort collectively as a district and as a community to get our numbers on the decline, to get them on the decline more consistently uh, so that we would be able to come back face to face. So what I'm talking about and proposing today is that we really look at adjusting our calendar to where instead of coming back face to face uh, on August 17th, number one, we don't change that date. Uh, we would keep it the same, but we would come back on August, the, or excuse me, September the 8th face to face and that August the 17th would be starting the remote instruction. So let, let me kind of walk you through what that would look like from a, from a calendar standpoint. We know that tomorrow our employees uh, come back. Uh, almost every one of them will be back tomorrow. If we were to wait a week and make this decision, then that means I'm asking our employees to shift gears during pre-planning. You also look at pre-planning, we've got just over two, right at two and a half weeks. Uh, total by the time you include open house. We feel like it's very fair for us to know that when our employees get prepared to come back and then when our families come back for open house, we want to be able to guide those families accurately 
uh, and effectively and give them the information that they need. So nothing changes from what the board adopted two weeks ago uh, as far as a start date and end date and all of that. What, what would be changing is a, is a remote start where we could focus our attention during pre-planning to ensuring that number one, the guidance that Ms. Bell and her team put together is communicated and understood by all, that the expectations for the school year are set uh, with our families to collectively during that open house week, that also during those first three weeks as we do remote, you're building those relationships, you're setting the expectations, we're identifying learning gaps, we're getting introduced to new content. Because we've got to keep in mind that we've not been in school since mid-March. So to now try and expect everybody to come back in a short period of time may not be in the best interest of everybody. So this is kind of a, an acclimation plan for us where our employees are going to come in for a period of time. Our employees and families are going to get used to the remote instruction so that a target date of September 8th, we can come back safely face-to-face uh, -face in an environment that we know our students benefit from the most. Um, Part of the reason we wanted to make this call before we got started as well is our teachers know what face-to-face -face instruction looks like. We may have more safety protocols in place, but at the end of the day, we know how to plan for brick and mortar instruction. What we struggle with is what happened back in March. When we shut down in March, no one was really prepared to provide quality instruction during that closure. What we have to do is ensure that we do a 180, that the instruction that we provide during the remote opportunities, number one, is a quality that we expect and that families expect, that the communication is as best as it can be, uh, but also that we're setting a great foundation uh, for the school year. And as you look at, at those pieces, we know that if we, at any point, if we're face-to-face, -face, excuse me, let me back that up. If we start remote and we go face-to-face, -face, that's an easy transition for a teacher because they know what face-to-face -face looks like. But if we haven't prepared effectively for the remote instruction and we have to go remote, whether that's at a classroom level, a grade level, a school level, or the district, we don't want it to be rushed and hurried and not have already started those uh, relationships and the connections with the students and families. So tonight, what I'm bringing before you would be a slight adjustment to the calendar uh, where we would be starting remote only because of the local data and the, da and the, uh, the spread that exists here in Gainesville and Hall County. Our hope is to watch that over the next few weeks uh, and hopefully a month from now know 100% sure we're ready to come back. We have everything in place. Our families have everything that they need uh, so that we can hit the ground running because we're just as anxious as you are. I've got two kids at home who I know when I share this with them, uh, they're going to be heartbroken and blame me for not starting back on August 17th to see their friends. Uh, but I also know that for me as a parent and a superintendent, we've got to be careful about how we return. And we feel like this acclimation plan is a good way to acclimate our employees, our families, and our students uh, back into a traditional face-to-face -face environment. One thing that is on this calendar that is different uh, is that checkpoint week. So we would still, if you see the week of August 31st, uh, that, that is kind of mirror open house where if we set that tone on the 10th, we've had remote instruction and remote instruction will continue for that week of the 31st, but also it's the opportunity to reset and recheck uh, where we need to be before we would start back in the face-to-face -face environment. So I wanted to uh, kind of put, put all that out there, let you ask questions. Uh, I know you've had questions, I've had questions. Miss um, Bell and Miss Collins and Miss Hobson are here uh, to answer any questions related to their specific departments. Uh, but we felt like at this time, if we were to wait any longer, uh, we would not be doing the service that, that we feel like is most comfortable as far as a, a safe, uh, equitable return. Dr. Williams, knowing that, so if we're going to do the first couple of weeks remote um, and, and postpone our coming back in person, during that remote period of time, will the teachers be in the school? Will they, they'll be running the remote classes out of the school. So they'll be located physically in our, our buildings, correct? Yeah, that, that is currently the plan. Uh, the reason is if we were to have everybody remote like we did in March, and now you're trying to bring everybody back at one time face-to-face, -face, nobody's acclimated to what the expectation is. It also will allow some Zoom collaborations. Uh, we also have made it clear that uh, employees' kids are more than welcome to come join them. I mean, you've got 750 square feet in a classroom uh, that it's you uh, and, and you're safe in that environment. 
And so, yes, our plan would be to bring the employees back so that when we do go face to face, it's not a major adjustment. In that third week of remote, that checkpoint week, it, it would work similar to open house where uh, students would have appointments to come in and meet face to face with their teacher. And, and it could be it could be completed um, via Zoom. That's well. Right. But yes, the, the point would be we've got to make contact, and right. we want to have as much contact as possible with our families. And then when we do go face to face, we don't want that contact to drop off just because we're face to face. Sir. Another point, uh, Chris, with to your question about uh, teaching from the classroom. Is that's where the resources are that's right. for everyone except the getting teachers who are having to, to uh, create and collate resources to their style of their needs and their and our standards. But that's, uh, I mean, you, you can walk in any elementary classroom and you see learning uh, on, on every wall, on every board. Every, every, all sides of the room, you see learning opportunities. So uh, that is an important uh, thing to, to remember for the good of the children. I'd like to add too that during that remote instruction, there will be live sessions. So what better way to do it than in your classroom with the kids seeing where they're going to be coming back to, in, you know, within a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, we, we feel like we, we've uh, been fairly thorough with this. We know that we're going to have some families that are upset that we're not going back face to face on the 17th, and we realize that. And we've got other families that, you know, just may have a, a breath of, okay, we need a little more time. Now, keep in mind, this is separate from the Gainesville Virtual Academy. So for the families who uh, selected the Gainesville Virtual Academy, this doesn't impact them at all. First day, still the 17th, going to be virtual. This would be impacting those that at some point will be face to face this first semester. And Dr. Williams, uh, a question was posed to me uh, by a parent. If you have signed up for Virtual Academy uh, with a release of this amended schedule, <clears throat> are there any outs to go back to face to face? Yeah, so right now, uh, all of our schools are working through the process of verifying or confirming the people who requested to go virtual. You can imagine we had some students who filled it out on behalf of the parents <laughs> to go virtual. Um, so our, all of our schools are going back to confirm. And they will still have, I believe it's through this Friday, the opportunity to sign up. But we still have a couple of weeks. And if anybody wants to opt out before we start school, that potential will be there. But once we start, uh, you can go into Gainesville Virtual Academy, but once you're in there, once school starts, you can't come back until January. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Is it a way to monitor uh, 7,000 students that we uh, you know, that, that, that may not, uh, I mean, is there any way, just maybe some students that don't have the resources? Uh, yeah, Ms. Bell, you want to talk a little bit about the, the remote instruction and if the devices or the access is not there, what has been, what is the work that's been going on? Sure, so we have been working very hard with our elementary academic coaches and then our middle school leadership and our high school leadership. has been working extremely hard with teachers to prepare them for what remote instruction might mean. And as we've sent out our guidance, we've been clear that remote does not necessarily mean online. Remote just means that teaching and learning take place outside of brick and mortar classrooms. So for instance, uh, students in pre-K through eight will have the option to have some paper packets delivered to them uh, in case we have families, and we do recognize that we'll probably have many that are unable to access materials online. Uh, we'll continue to work with families as we can to ensure that they have internet access and device access primarily at the high school because uh, pre-K through eight will have that packet, that paper packet option. Again, uh, we are also having conversations with all of our uh, leadership that an important thing to remember is that we recognize that though not every family has a Chromebook or a laptop, many of our families do have phones. And so sometimes we might need to consider delivery of instruction via a video that could be accessed on a phone we're not going to ask students to write papers on a phone at this moment. Uh, we'll wait until we get back face to face to do that. So those are some of the examples of some of the things we've been talking about. And, and some of the uh, 
things down the road. I know that Ms. Hobson and the, what y'all approved back in April, the 4,000 Chromebooks, as they'll be coming in hopefully at the end of August, that we'll be able to have either that checkpoint or soon thereafter. Uh, also, as a board, if you remember last week, you approved those antennas uh, ancient schools. That's going to provide them if they've got a device to access to be able to, to access the content at any time of the day. You know, it's not going to be just open at certain times. So some of those creative things we're, we're trying to get to, but we do realize there's still going to be some gaps. The, the number one thing we have to have from every family is communication. We've got to know where our families are, what they're doing, what uh, schedule works best for them because then we can tailor the instructional supports for them. And that's what was so tough about March was when we went to a closure, we didn't have some email addresses. We didn't have some phone numbers. We had no way of getting in contact with some kids. And so we had to get our counselors and social workers to go and visit homes and try to find families. And, you know, we don't mind doing that because we're still going to be providing support. But if we've got that expectation and communication up front, it should make it easier to make, to ensure we're meeting the needs of the kids. Uh, I have a question about the health data, which is pretty compelling, I will say. Uh, you are monitoring uh, local and state uh, health trends. How much notice, how much time might we have to uh, notify homes, students' homes, that we need to shift our calendar from this to plan C or stay with this. How, how much how much impact in terms of timing is is the data going to allow us to have? So so let's talk worst case scenario. <clears throat> the worst case scenario is that we have to extend remote instruction beyond this three week window we would be making a determination the week of August the 24th. So that the week after that checkpoint week, if we, if we have to go back or continue remote, then we've got that checkpoint week set up to do the next three weeks. And so <clears throat> what we've determined is basically a three week cycle. If things continue to get worse, then we might have to go remote for three more weeks, then we'll wait three more weeks until we can go face to face. Uh, but our next determination will be the week of August the 24th and if you look at some of that data from before, when we had a previous peak, it took about three to five weeks to see it decline a good bit, which is going to put us right in that spot to know if it is on a decline and we feel comfortable with opening uh, September the 8th and we're ready to hit the ground running. A sidebar question to that is uh, homes, students, and their families were, are going to want to know if if there happens to be a crisis in, in a classroom or in a grade level or in a school then uh, what then happens when you declare there is a crisis from a communication standpoint yes. um, so and timing. timing would be uh, immediate the next day once we find out that we've got a case and um, Ms. Ms. Bell can speak a little bit more to the specifics of it. The health guidance went out today, I believe just a few moments ago, to our employees as far as what to expect regarding isolation versus quarantine, a positive case versus exposure. You know, when you look at, and, and this has been the challenge of all of it, we, we've been very uh, upfront with our administrators about we don't want you as an administrative team locked up in a room working together. Because if one of you winds up getting positive and all of you get exposed, that school now doesn't have administrators. Same thing with the grade level, whether it's fourth grade, a certain team at the middle school. We have to be, we have to be realistic that the pod or the group of kids that I'm working with may not all be impacted. It may be a kid that sits in an area that uh, other children are around him or her, but we would uh, communicate those families. We would obviously would not say um, which child, but we would say your child's been exposed and here are the next steps. But Ms. Bell can provide a little bit more detail on that. Sure, absolutely. We have a great team working on this project and we are working hard on our protocols and have actually been testing them out a bit. Um, we anticipate that if there is an emergency and a class needs to close, a grade level, a school, uh, that the process would be that we very quickly identify through some 
uh, conversations with school leadership who has been in close contact. So let's say a, a Ms. Bill's first grade classroom has closed. Then we would very quickly identify the students and other adults that would be impacted. We collect those names. We have a team that works on placing phone calls immediately uh, so that they know prior to the following day. We share that information as required with Department of Public Health. Uh, but we have prioritized providing our own phone calls first to ensure that they can receive that information in the most timely fashion possible. And then we send a follow-up email with the same information we provided by phone so that they have it in writing. And we've had the opportunity to practice this in the last couple of weeks. Indeed we have, and Ms. Collins has done a fantastic job in helping support our staff, and Ms. Wales and I are working with students. As you can see, I'm smiling with my eyes. I'm smiling over here. <laughs> and I think one of the things that, that Sarah mentions in the guidance that she's got out in her video, and it's, and it's very important, this guidance that's putting out there is not for people to memorize, to know, okay, I've been exposed or I tested positive, and now here's what I need to do. If it's an employee, it goes to Ms. Collins, if it's student related, it goes to Ms. Bell and, and Ms. Wells. We'll take care of the rest. We'll take care of the communication the notifications, all of those different things. We'll tell you when you can come back to school. All of that we can take care of. Um, but it's important that our teachers don't feel that extra burden of having to tell a kid, hey, why are you back? No, we'll, we'll communicate all of that to the families. Sarah, I, I guess also uh, this leads to a concern about uh, misinformation or gossip or I heard uh, that is likely. I think we do have to acknowledge that it's likely, and I think a lot of problems could be solved if we could cut down on gossip. But we have been very clear uh, with our staff members that we want to avoid conversations about, I heard so and so, this is what I think happened. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, we don't know. And what we are finding as we've worked through this process is that uh, one of the reasons we've asked staff not to share with students or other staff members when they can or can't return or what they should or should not do is the situations are very individualized. We are even having to call Department of Public Health sometimes to seek their advice. Here's the situation, what do we need to do? And so there's really not, even though it is presented that way in the health guidance, uh, a blanket solution every time. So um, I guess it's just important to know that although we can't stop what we know will happen, students will notice when other students aren't there, and teachers will notice when other teachers aren't there. The bottom line is that uh, there could be various reasons that somebody might be out. Sometimes we're just being extra cautious, just to be honest. Um, and again, the, the situations are very individual in nature. Oh, have we been asked uh, through our nurse core to uh, provide uh, COVID testing at, on our campuses? We have not. Uh, there have been questions from employees about why we are not doing some kind of blanket testing prior to starting school. What we are learning as we're working with the Department of Public Health is that a test-based strategy is not recommended. So for instance, uh, what we're finding is if, if unfortunately we have to place a phone call, if I have to call Dr. Williams and say we're concerned that you have been exposed potentially to COVID-19, then his automatic reaction might be, well, I need to go get tested. That's actually not the guidance that we're hearing uh, from the Department of Public Health. There's actually research about the optimal time, if you will, to be tested. So for instance, if I have to ask Dr. Williams to quarantine for 14 days, the DPH guidance is that the most appropriate day for him to be tested with the highest likelihood of a reliable result is on the 10th day of his quarantine. So we, we don't really see uh, that testing necessarily is the solution in the same way that uh, as guidance has, has changed, we didn't see that uh, temperature checks were maybe the preferred uh, methodology. So we're learning, as I think everyone is, about best practices, but that's our current, the current advice we've received. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, if we had everybody tested, let's say yesterday on Monday, <clears throat> we said if you test a negative, you can't come in. But then somebody goes out and does something this weekend, 
and they're around someone else who's positive, that's just that one point in time and it doesn't really help us. Um, instead, we have to focus more on the behaviors, washing hands, wearing masks, socially distance. Because the reality is we know we're gonna have teachers and employees right now who can't come back to pre-planning because they've tested positive or have been around someone who, who has tested positive. That means that tomorrow we're the first day of school, that means I've got that number of employees who I would have to find a sub to now serve those children for a period of time, whether it was five days left in the quarantine or they just started. And so we're optimistic that by getting in with pre-planning, by having some of the remote instructional start, we can also ensure that the habits that we have as professionals also uh, follow into our personal lives and that we can continue to work with the families on there's not a, oh, I got to go here, so now I've got to behave this way. And now I go here and I got to behave that way. Either we're being cautious or we're not. And we have to continue to push that. And if we want the, the peak to go down, we have to be consistent across the board. Dr. Williams, as a uh, father with two kids in a system like you, I, I can say that we are very eager to get back in person as well. And I think the vast majority of the parents I have heard from uh, are eager to, to get back to in-person instruction. Um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, for everybody back in the spring was just kind of the uncertainty. We closed down quickly, we had to, we weren't really sure what that meant. Um, I do think it's important to, for all of our parents to understand that our default uh, desire is gonna be to get back in person as quickly as possible. Um, and I know that, you know, some of the bigger systems in Metro Atlanta that have closed down indefinitely through January. I know as a parent, I'm left wondering, you know, is that an overreaction? And, and so uh, I am glad that our plan is to get back in person on September the 8th, but I do think it's important for all of our parents to understand that our decision to postpone this three weeks is because of specific guidance we've gotten from the hospital here in our community about this spike. It's not a general, we heard some bad news nationwide and we're reacting to that. Um, and hopefully if we can all wear our masks and wash our hands and be smart about how we do things, then we'll be able to see those numbers go back down here locally in Gainesville, Georgia and get back on September the 8th. But this is not a situation like it was in the spring where we're just you know, gonna be doing virtual indefinitely. Yeah, and I think a couple of things that go along with that, Mr. Nordhol, is the fact that by having employees continue to come in, there's that hope that we'll be back. We're still gonna have our extracurricular groups meeting. So it's not like we're shutting down things. We're just transitioning how we're gonna learn for a very short period of time so that we can come back safely. That's right, thank you. Dr. Angie, do you have anything to say? <laughs> um, well, last night I was contacted by a nurse um, who works with the CDC and they are collaborating with the Georgia Health Department and one of the camps um, who had a very quick, rapid 44% um, infection rate with COVID in less than a week. Um, they're contacting all of those, the staff and the students that or kids that attended the camp, and they're trying to come up with some guidelines um, with the data um, to just figure out how it spread among children because in the very beginning we didn't think it was spread among children and now we're finding out it in fact is, it may not be as severe as some adults, but they can still give it to adults, which can create a lot of issues. Um, she said that their guidelines were to have the data collected and um, try to evaluate the information to present some guidelines within the three week structure because they know a lot of schools are closing down for the first three weeks um, to maybe give us some better guidelines with actual data instead of just, you know, figuring it out case by case. So hopefully something will come out of that in the next couple of weeks. I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Ramsey, because I think what it comes down to, and I think this is the part that sometimes we miss, is we really don't know a whole lot about the kids. When we shut down, and everybody did, kids were not in groups of 20 and 30 every day. They weren't interacting with the 100 across the middle school team. And just now, with camps and all starting, we're starting to see some of that infection going on, and we really don't know because individually we've been with our friends and tight family. You know, that, that's it. 
And so, you know, we do want to be very careful to see how that's there. The other side is we want to ensure that our employees feel comfortable having so many kids back in their classroom. We are running about 20% of our uh, students have expressed an interest in the virtual school. So that kind of takes a class, let's say if it was 25, you're now down to 19. And that, that's more manageable. Uh, so some of those things we'll start to see uh, kind of get pieced together here pretty soon. And Dr. Williams, you, you uh, I believe it was in the view of Mrs. Bell said, it's been pretty uniform across grade level, the, the enrollment in the virtual academy. So it's not just concentrated in this school or it was early on, and then I think recently you're starting to see friends say, hey, I'm going virtual, so are you going to go virtual? Or families doing some of these <laughs> pandemic pods, where they're going to say, well, we can get our kids together, and we're going to go over here. Um, but I think ninth and 12th grade are a little high right now. Uh, but otherwise, maybe six. Some of those transitional years you, you expect to see, but nothing that's uh, just out there. Any other questions or comments? Oh, you just mentioned briefly the effect this revised calendar uh, on uh, student activities. But uh, we have some going under new guidelines. Uh, but uh, for middle school activities, for high school clubs, et cetera, what, what is the effect? Here? Right now, there is no effect. Uh, we're still having groups that are meeting during the day believe uh, football started acclimation today but once again they're all following the health guidelines that we've set up that if somebody tests positive and they've been in close contact with someone for that period of time then we're we're shutting them down putting them into quarantine for a couple of weeks so the, the uh, extracurricular opportunities are giving us a chance to teach kids as well about proper hygiene and uh, decision making uh, sarah can i ask you to repeat something that you that I asked the last gathering, it was just uh, quite compelling to me. I asked about uh, nurse subs or and over overabundance of uh, supplies, health related supplies, and then you mentioned the uh, medical intern corps as well. Yes, actually received an email about that today. With the health system and are proud to be. Uh, and the rotation of their medical residents. And so even though uh, we have potentially this change to our schedule, uh, they would be able to be with us prior to that. Uh, their actual start date is August 3rd on their rotation, and so they would be available to us prior to that time. Uh, if we need to have their support in parent education, student education, uh, working in the hub, then they're help there to help us do that. Are guidelines these uh, internal lists or feeds or uh, across the board? This is the family medicine, uh, family medicine residence. Family medicine. Yes, sir. So they, the community piece is an important part of their education. Yeah. And so that was really a great fit. So, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, Sam, you have some discussion on uh, two items very quickly. Uh, I would like to, uh, if the board will uh, not object, I'd like to ask uh, the high school administration to see if we might get a student to come to us at our August meeting with a nice tribute to Congressman John Lewis. Uh, and again, ask the high school administration to identify and coach it. But it would be a nice, Mr. Lewis did not represent Gainesville in the U.S. House, but he, but he surely did uh, in the United I think it would be a nice tribute for us, uh, especially if it could be led by students. So the thought is presenting if there's no objection. No objection here. Uh, secondly,
your honor. Mr. Chair, I would like to add one final thing because we're not really adjusting the calendar, just kind of how instruction is happening. That's why the board's not voting uh, tonight. If there's any major objections to it, you know, we can, we can look at uh, continuing, but otherwise, we will continue to push this information out this evening uh, to staff and tomorrow afternoon and evening to families. When do we meet next? Next Monday. Uh, will calendar be on the agenda again for questions or comments or um, I, I'm not suggesting that. We, I guess we can put it in the discussion on it. Any yeah. yeah. board member feels like that. I mean, because I'm sure we're going to get questions after this Absolutely. is rolled out. So. Well, we encourage you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Dr. Ramsey. All those in favor? Thank you.